Hallelujah. The Bible says in Psalms 22, 3, God inhabits, God dwells in the praises of His people. Amen. How many of you believe God is in this place? Amen. Uh, the song which you're going to sing is, it says like, I praise in the valley, I praise on the mountain. High or low, our, rem- our worship and praise consistently remains the same for God. Can you give a clap for offering to the Lord? Amen. Here we go. Let's put our hands together and praise the Lord. Come on, everyone. Oh, we worship you, Lord Jesus. Let's sing. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm sure. I praise when I'm doubting. Come on. I praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Praise is the waters. Praise is the waters. My enemy is drowning. As long as I'm breathing. As long as I'm breathing. I've got a reason.
Come on, hallelujah. Exodus chapter 15 verse 2 says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. How many of you are ready to exalt Jesus today? When you exalt Jesus, everything no, disappear. All the heavy burdens disappear. Amen. If we're going to sing one more time, praise. Every praise is good. Come on, let's put our hands together.
thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Come on, let's worship him this morning. Come on, people, open your mouths and give glory because he deserves it. We worship you, Lord Father. We lift your name in this place, Lord. More than any other name, the name of Jesus is so powerful. It's so tremendous. It has more strength. It can deliver people from bondage. Sir. Oh, we worship. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountains I could not climb. In desperation, in desperation. Come on. I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Then through the darkness, then through the darkness, your loving kindness, so through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Come on, people. The end is near. Declare that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's all live hands
and worship him this morning. Come on, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord, for who you are, for what you have done in our life, oh Father. Come on, people, declare, Lord Father, declare the grave has no claim on me, oh Lord Father. Lord Father, we declare sickness has no claim on us, oh Father. We declare problems has no claim on us. We declare the devil has no claim on us because we are your sons and daughters, oh Lord Father. Come on, people, if you love the Lord this morning, worship Him. Worship is an expression to show that you love the Lord with all your heart. Hallelujah. This is a medium to worship Him. Come on, lift your hands and say, Lord, we want to worship You more and more. Lord Father, thank You that You are a bondage breaker. Thank You that You are a Savior, oh Father. Thank You that You lead people, Lord Father. When you come in, everything changes out, oh Father. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Come on, people. God wants to listen to your own words. The words, the worship that comes from your heart. He's here in this place this morning. He's waiting to talk with you. He's waiting to listen your voice, to listen and accept your worship. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark. You give hope. You restore. Time. You give life, you are love, yes, you bring light to the dark, you give hope, you restore every heart. Can you lift your hands and sing?
God of generation. He holds his promise and he fulfills it. If there are unfulfilled promises in your life, say to the Lord, I know you're going to fulfill it. I know the time is coming for that. Thank you that you're going to take care of me. Thank you that you're going to finish everything for me, Lord. Father. We worship you, Lord, this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. Thank you for blessing us through the worship, Lord Father. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you for your presence that's moving in his place. Pray for your servant. Speak through him. Let our hearts speak to you and let our ears be heard towards your word, O oh Father, with attentiveness. Thank you, Lord, for you are in this place. Lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as I was um, praying for you guys, uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the importance of Christ-centered relationships for the gospel mission. You know, um, the relationships that you share in a church are not meant just for you to enjoy and become a bit of a club. It's actually for you to enjoy together so that you can encourage each other to be faithful to the gospel mission that Jesus has for the church. And um, I want to preach from Romans 16 this morning. And um, I would ask you to turn there in the meantime as we get into it. <clears throat> you know, 
You know, in my experience, uh, the parts of scripture that people skip over the most are the greetings at the beginning of a letter or at the end, or when you have the genealogies. You know, when you have the genealogies, they say this person is the father of that person and that person and that person. Normally when you get to it, you just quickly skip over, right? And you get on to the more important or supposedly more important parts of the scripture. But if you look closely, there's so much to be observed and learned from just the greetings even in the scripture. It's, there's a reason why God put it there. They give us insights into the context. It makes us understand who Paul is writing to or whoever is writing to. And so every part of scripture is significant and God chose to put it in there. And if you're thinking about Romans 16, we're coming now to the end of this book. The end of the book. And um, Paul's main reason for writing this book was firstly to clarify what the gospel is. And it's so important that in every generation we need to know what the gospel is. Because without the gospel, we have no leg to stand on, right? We don't know who we are. We don't know who our God is. We don't know what Christ has done for us. So he hasn't been to this church, but he writes this letter to say, this is what I believe the gospel is. The second thing that he wrote the letter for was to see how he could partner with people on the basis of the gospel. Because you can partner in ministry for many different things, but what's most important is that you partner on the basis of the gospel because that's what you're going to be taking out to people for it to bring change and to make disciples. But the third reason why Paul wrote Romans was to deal with certain issues in the church, challenges in the church, and to show how the gospel would help people to resolve and uh, work through those challenges. But also what it does is it gives us almost like a window into the early church. And what a beautiful snapshot it is. All of this deep theology that Paul has been speaking about around the gospel and reflection, now he gives us a little snapshot of how it is played out and lived out in the church. And that's what's important, right? Theology that is then applied to people's lives in the context of a community is what makes it real. And so you get to see it played out in relationships between real people. Real people who are not perfect, but are trusting in a perfect Savior. And they want to follow Jesus, and they want to fulfill His missions. And so relationship is really important. What Paul wants to show us as we read Romans 16 is the beauty and the importance of Christ-centered relationships for the advancement of the gospel mission. The beauty and the importance of of Christ-centered relationships for the advancement of the gospel mission. Now before we read this, you and I know in life, relationships are tricky, right? How many of you have been burnt by relationships before? Be honest, you can put your hand up. Right? Many of us are, have. Relationships are risky because you have to make yourself vulnerable to get to know people. Relationships are hard work. Yet relationships are necessary and vital for all life, especially for a disciple of Jesus. There's a type of relationship to share with other disciples of Jesus in the church that is so vital and it's so unique. It is different. That's why Jesus said, by your love for one another, people will know that you are my disciples. There's something unique and distinct about Christian relationships that points people towards Jesus. So let's read Romans 16, verses 1 to 16. And forgive me for pronouncing some of these names. Maybe for some of you that are looking for having children in the future, there's some names that you can use here. But let's read together. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Can Cry, that you may welcome her in, a lo in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert in, to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. 
Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachius. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asyncritus, Philegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And Lord, we pray, would you open our eyes and our hearts to see and hear what you are saying through your perfect and powerful word. Change us by your spirit, we pray. Help us to respond in obedience to your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So normally, you would read something like this, and to be honest, you would skip over it, right? Because it's just a bunch of names of people. It's just like, man, I want to, I've read the main part of the book. Now this is just his final greeting, so... You know, what's anything good about it? It seems like an unimportant list of people that Paul mentions. But if you look closely at these people, you will see that it is profound. It gives us a beautiful picture of the type of relationships that the early church enjoyed and also that they pursued. Now, if you have read the book of Romans before, you know that Paul hasn't been to this church He's writing to this church to say, I'm going to come to see you. I long to come to you that I may preach the gospel to you and impart some spiritual gift to you that we will be mutually encouraged in the faith. So he hasn't been there. He desires to be with them. But he seems to know some specific people there. These are names of people that are not just acquaintances to Paul. They're not just Paul's resources to be used. They are not people that Paul just knows because we need to get a job done. These are not just mere workers or slaves who do work for the mighty man of God. These are people that Paul knows and Paul loves and Paul holds dear. These are people who are in churches and serve in churches. These are people who have moved to different regions to be part of new churches to see the gospel advance and the kingdom of God advance. These are people who support Paul and support the churches that he works with. So these are not just ordinary unimportant people and Paul's relationship with these people was actually the basis of his credibility as a faithful apostle of Jesus Christ why do I say that when you look at these people and you look at their relationships that they shared with Paul and his heart for them they are the people that can show that Paul is a faithful apostle of Jesus Christ not only by what he preaches but how he treats the people and loves the people that he works with and isn't that true for any leader you want to see their faithfulness in ministry yes listen to them what are they preaching but also see how they relate to people how do they have relationships with people that they serve with people in the church do they really love them is there a heart of concern to see them grow in the lord or they merely use the people so that they can get their ministry done and you never get that sense when you see paul's heart here Paul's relationship with these people was, and their testimony was evidence of the type of person he really was. These people could honestly vouch for Paul because they knew him personally. These people where he shared close relationships were able to give the truest testimony of him. And we all know the people that can give the truest testimony of us, either in our homes, <clears throat> if we married our wives and our children, they know us the best. And also people that we travel with to do ministry with. If they're in close quarters with you, they know you. So they know how you treat others. They know your weaknesses. They know your strengths. They know your sins and your shortcomings. They know your temptations. They know what you really love and what you really are about, right? And so that's the tough part about building relationships is that people are going to get to see you firsthand. But it shouldn't be something that should stop you from building relationships. Because God uses that to make you more like Jesus Christ. So let's look at the type of relationship that Paul had with those that he mentions in the scriptures here. Firstly, Paul says these relationships were unique 
and they were between believers. He says these relationships were in Christ and they were for Christ's mission. So they were in Christ and then they were for Christ's mission. So these are relationships that are in Christ. And there's a reason why I said Christ-centered relationships. Okay, because we can have relationships based on many different things. It can be to, because we are school friends, we need to study together. It can be because we have a business and we need to expand our business. It can be just somebody to keep you company. And you can have relationships for many different things. But these relationships, Paul says here, they're in Christ. They're between believers, fellow believers of Christ. These are not relationships with people that are outside the body of Christ. Now, it's not wrong to have relationships with people outside the body of Christ. Um, we all have them. I have relationships with people outside of Christ. I'm praying for them. I love them dearly. But the reality is that we, at the deepest part of our core, we don't share the same thing in common. And so it's, these are priority relationships between Christian believers which must be pursued. I've found too many believers spend too much time trying to share deep, meaningful relationships with unbelievers at the expense of building Christ-centered relationships. What does it do? It leads them astray. It exposes them to constant temptation, which they're not strong enough to overcome. And so, yes, we need to be salt and light. We need to engage with the world and pray and reach them with the gospel. But we need to reach them on the basis that we are different. So we are different to the world and we engage and touch a world on the basis that we are different. But where we go and try to pursue relationships in Christ or outside of Christ and we don't have a desire to see people change, we are tempted and we can be led astray. Why do I say Christian relationships? Every time it's mentioned here on the list, Paul refers to them as being in Christ or in the Lord. Do you see that? My brother in Christ or in the Lord. The only reason Paul has a relationship with these people is because they are in Christ. Without Christ, he may never have had a relationship with them. Now look around, look around you to your left and to your right. Can you look? Do you think that you would have had a relationship with these people if it weren't for Christ? Where would you have been? I often think about that. But we share something significant. You might be very different. You might speak even a different first language. You might come from a different part of this state or outside. Your upbringing might have been very different. But what you have in common is that you are in Christ. And so you can have a unity in diversity that comes in Christ, right? And so these relationships are Christ-centered. So if you have to look at these relationships, Paul is saying is what holds them together is that Christ is at the center. And that's important to understand because Christ is the end of these relationships Christ is the one that shapes these relationships. Christ determines how people respond to each other in these relationships. These are relationships that are shaped by Christ's love. These are relationships that are shaped by Christ's teaching and His truth. These are relationships that are marked by Jesus' grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His patience, His selflessness. These are gospel-centered and shaped relationships. They're not perfect on this side of eternity, but with Christ as the focus, these relationships have everything they need to succeed, to flourish, and to pursue Jesus' mission. And even when there is sin and failure and weakness in these relationships, through Christ, people can forgive, people can repent, people can make right, people can reconcile, and there can be restoration. Because that's why Christ came, to reconcile us to God, to reconcile us to one another. And so what I'm saying to you this morning, New Creations Churches, there is no other human relationships that compare to Christ-centered relationships. There is nothing like the Christian community, the church walking in relationships rooted in and shaped by Jesus Christ. There's absolutely nothing. The greatest reason to show that our faith is genuine jesus says is by your love for one another in other words a world looking in to this community can say i know that these people are followers of jesus why i can see how they love one another i can see they're very different but i can see there's forgiveness i can see there's grace for one another 
I can see there's a desire to see others develop and grow. There's not selfishness and personal agendas, but this is shaped by Jesus' love and mercy. And you know, a broken world looking in wants relationships like this, but they cannot find it. It's marked by selfishness, what you can get out of it outside of the body of Christ. And so people are looking for real community and real relationships. That's why I say relationships are so important for the gospel mission. Because it's almost like, let me give you a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. Look at our love for one another. And it gives you a reason to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are not corporate relationships. Those are for something different, right? Sometimes in a corporate setting, it's a culture of ruthless performance and profit making and competition is central. So here, what do you do in some of the corporates? I don't know about whether it's here, but I know where I come from in Johannesburg. It's the corporate capital of South Africa. It's ruthless. People are used as tools, as resources, so that we can achieve bottom line results at the company. We have to make a profit, so it doesn't matter about the people. And if the people are not needed, they are dumped. If they don't perform, they are let go. And there's nothing wrong with seeking growth or having a purpose in relationships, but if they are not rooted in Christ, then there's no love, there's no grace, there's no mercy, just cold, functional interaction that has no lasting value. And because these relationships are in Christ, they're not just for the here and now, just for a temporary season. No, these relationships have eternal implications. It is for eternity. The relationships we build with other believers is for eternity because they're going to be with us in the new heavens and the new earth, right? And so it's been, I don't know about you, when was the last time that India won the Cricket World Cup? Was it 2011? Did they win any other major trophy after that? They did the T20? No. Okay. And what was it like in your country at the time when India won the World Cup with the South African coach, by the way, I must mention? <laughs> I'm just joking. What was it like? Was there like a sense of expectation in your country? Were all the people seeming like they were united together and rooting for India? Was that true? Hey? And um, there seemed like there would be some hope for the country, more for unity. And how many years has it been now? Okay. And have you guys seen some long-lasting effects of that? Is it, has it brought real unity in your country? Has it changed all of the challenges? No, it hasn't, Right. Similar to us, our country has just won the Rugby World Cup. Okay, and we won two in a row. And um, it's amazing how the country comes together. And it's awesome. Everybody on a Friday wears green because that's our con the colors of our country. Everyone gets behind it. And there's this camaraderie. There's this people from different uh, race groups, different upbringings. Everyone is beyond. We call them the Springboks, the rugby team. Everyone is behind them. They've even done a documentary with them. And it shows even these players together. Man, they are so together. And they are different. Some come from black South African backgrounds. Some come from white Afrikaans backgrounds. Some English. And they're together. And while they're in this team, everything they're doing is, they'll tell you it's for the country. So that it can bring us together. And um, throughout the whole time, they track how they work. They train together. The decisions that they make. How they chose the captain. All of these things is so that it can bring unity in our country. And um, so they won the World Cup in 2019, and it was amazing. And we did the same thing after four years, and they won the World Cup again uh, um, last year. And it was amazing. Our country celebrated. Um, they did these tours around the country with the, with the bus, with the trophy, and all of these things. And it was amazing. It did bring us together, but it only lasted for a short while. Our country still remains with the same issues, with the same challenges that we have in our country. Why? Because those relationships were geared to get a trophy that will only last for the year and now. But we need relationships that will last for eternity, that bring an eternal reward. Okay? And so the relationship that you share with one another bring an eternal reward beyond this time. It can do far more than the great sporting achievements, than any of the other political achievements that people want to get the relationships that you and I share together in the body of Christ can see others come into relationship with Christ and it is for eternity. And that is why it's so important that we understand that 
Our relationships are in Christ, but it's also for Christ's mission. Okay? What you share together is not just so that you can have a little holy club by yourself. Okay? And nobody else can enter it. When you love the way Christ loved, and you share with one another these relationships, you'll see that they are selfless. They want to welcome others in who don't know Christ. They are looking away from yourself, not just what you can get out of them. And they are for eternity. So let's look at relationships for Christ's mission. You know, what surprises me in this passage is Paul has not been to this church. I can say today I've come to New Creations Church in Goa. Okay? And I know some of you. But Paul hadn't been to this church. But he somehow knew these people. Where did he know them from? He must have worked together with them in other churches, in other regions, to see the gospel advance and to see disciples made and to see churches planted. But they were close relationships. Why? You can see that they were for the mission of Jesus Christ. Paul knows them. He's not been to Rome, but he knows these people by name. He even knows some people's mums because he's been in their home. That's how close it is. And so what do you get to see here is that because these relationships are for Christ's mission, the people worked hard for the expansion of the gospel. Paul mentions here, these are my fellow workers. These are people who worked hard a few times. So even with these relationships, there was hard work to see people come to Christ and to be disciples. And so we cannot be afraid or ignore the fact that there's hard work to be done in the kingdom of God, sacrificial work in churches and beyond churches to see the gospel advanced. And I want to say this, and I want to say this as a commendation to you, New Creations Church. This is something that I see in your church. And I want to commend you for it. You all serve so sacrificially. You work hard. That's just been my observation. People are willing to give off their time, of their talents, of their treasures um, for the kingdom of God. I've seen that in the pastors, in your elders, um, those that are involved in the worship band, kids, uh, youth, whatever else that you might be serving in. I see this desire to work hard for the Lord because He's given you the grace for that. And I want to say well done to you. It's a wonderful example for me and for others who come and who see you as you function together in your church. Keep going. I want to say that to you, dear friends, brothers, sisters in the Lord, keep going. Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. That's what Paul says. Your hard work for the Lord, for the extension of the kingdom of God, is never in vain. And the Lord will reward you. Thank you. As you build relationships with one another in this time, and as you seek to see the gospel advanced, keep each other accountable to work hard but not to be burnt out. Okay? Because if you love one another, you work hard, you spend, but you make sure you don't burn out because God has got much for you to do. Keep working hard or keep going in your service to the Lord. Keep building Christ-centered relationships with people who can teach you a godly, hard work ethic in the kingdom of God. They will help you to think of God's gospel mission through New Creations Church and beyond New Creations Church. These relationships were hard work also because they were about making disciples. Did you see that? I just want to look at two people in here that Paul mentioned. The first one is Epineatus. Did you see his name there? Difficult one. Maybe if you want to get married one day and maybe where's Solomon if you're having a second baby. There's a name for you there. I'm just joking. But... This guy, Paul describes as the first convert in Asia. Okay? So I don't know exactly where in Asia, but in Asia, the same continent that we're in now. But then where is Paul writing this to? Where is this guy now? He's in Rome. And which continent is that? In Europe. Okay? And maybe it was how they classified it at that time, but he was in another continent altogether. Okay? He's probably in the church in Rome serving there. I'm not sure how long after his conversion it was, but this guy had moved to Rome. So what do you get here? You get the sense that these relationships are not static. They don't just stay in the same place. People are growing. People are participating in God's mission. 
and it goes beyond their local church. It goes to other regions of the world. So when you're involved in these relationships and people spur you on, you begin to think far bigger than just your local church. What about the spread of the gospel to other nations and to other cities, to other states in India? The second group of people Paul mentions is the Jewish couple Priscilla and Aquila. If you've read in Acts 18, you will see that Paul met them on, in Corinth on his missionary journey there. They had been expelled from Rome because the emperor said all the Jews must get out of Rome. And uh, Paul remained in Corinth and he taught there for about a year and a half, teaching people the word of God. And they would have been recipients of that training. They would have been equipped by Paul in God's word. Later, Paul took them with him to Ephesus. He left them in Ephesus and he continued on his missionary journeys. At Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila, they helped Apollos understand the gospel more fully because he came in and he only knew it in part. And they helped him understand it more fully. They took him aside and they taught him the gospel more fully. Now they were equipped and they equipped Apollos who was very useful to the apostles in their missionary endeavors. You get to see it here, hey? Eh? People are learning, they are being equipped, and then they get sent out. It's never something that's just static. Yes, there might be a few people that are in these churches, but Priscilla and Aquila were trained, were equipped, and then they were sent out or released. Later, these, this same couple, they would help Timothy in Ephesus when he led the church there through very difficult times. And Paul sends greeting to them in 2 Timothy 4 to them. And he says, greet also Priscilla and Aquila. So when Timothy is there and he's trying to preach to this church because they have gone as there's false teachers in there and all of these things, what's happening? He greets Priscilla and Aquila. They are there supporting Timothy in that difficult time. Now in this letter, they seem to be back in Rome. What are they doing there now? Leading a house group or a house church. Can you see how they have been discipled? So they began to disciple others. They were not static in their growth, friends, and in the advancement of the gospel. And so that's why I want to encourage you. Christ-centered relationships help you to grow, and it also helps others to grow. It helps you to grow and helps others to grow. So I want to ask you some questions this morning for you individually. Who are you building Christ-centered relationships with that will help you grow in the Lord? Who are you building Christ-centered relationships with that will help you grow in the Lord? That's the first question. We all need to have somebody or some people that is helping, up grow, helping us grow. And the second question I want to ask you is, who are you building Christ-centered relationships with that will help them grow in the Lord? Who are you building Christ-centered relationships that will help them grow in the Lord? Okay, we need it both ways. You need to grow. Others need to grow as well. So this is being discipled and it is making disciples. Both are applicable. And the last question I would ask you is, are you in Christ? And it's an important question because we can't build Christ-centered relationships if we are not in Christ ourselves. We need to be in Christ and that's a specific way that Paul puts it across most of his letters. We are in Christ. In other words, we are united to Christ. We are in union with Christ. He's the head. We are the body. We are connected to Him from which every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours through Christ. It's not somebody that knows Christ from a distance. It's somebody that's in Christ. There's a close relationship in Christ. And if you're not in Christ this morning... I want to encourage you to come to Christ, to put your trust in Him, to accept Him. He is able to not only forgive your sins and to redeem you, He's able to reconcile you to God as your Father, and He's able to call you into close relationship with Him. There's no greater relationship than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and walking with Him. There can be nothing greater than that. And so, yes, we might want these relationships, but first... We need to be in Christ so that we can enjoy these relationships. So come to Him. These relationships are also diverse. Very diverse. And I love that Paul 
had these diverse relationships. There were Jews and Gentiles. There were men and women. There were families and households. There were couples. They were all differently gifted. You got some were missionary orientated like Prisca and Aquila, Andronicus, Junior, Phoebe. They were also probably at different ages, different levels of maturity in their faith in the Lord. But yet these were real relationships with real people in real life and they were so diverse. Paul knew and to remind us that we need diverse relationships. We need these relationships where we can see people grow and see the gospel advance. And we need to build these types of relationships. Young people need to build relationships with older people as well and vice versa. Young people... We need your energy. It's important, that fervor for us to keep our eyes on the Lord. But young people, you also need old people to help you to be grounded for the long haul. That you don't fizzle out. That you stay the course. You need both young and old people in the church and everything in between. Immature believers, you need mature believers and vice versa. You need each other. I love meeting new believers when they've just come to meet the Lord and they have a passion to serve the Lord. They have a great sense of zeal in their hearts. It does something for us because we get complacent along the way. When you meet with new believers, it's wonderful, this sense they've met Christ. There's no greater joy than seeing someone come to Christ. I don't know if you share the same thing as me, but I love it. And when you sit down with them and you're going through the foundations of what it means to be a disciple, you are reminded of the gospel. And you're reminded we never graduate from the gospel, right? The longer you serve the Lord, the gospel becomes more glorious. Because you realize how great a sinner you were and what a great love and mercy was extended to you to save you. You thank the Lord more. Hey? And so it's amazing. But then those immature believers also need the mature believers. To say, hey, keep your trust in the Lord. Let me help you with making wise decisions. You know, um, let me show you what Jesus says throughout the whole Bible so you can be grounded in something. The introverts, how many introverts Yeah, You need the extroverts, right? And the extroverts, you desperately need the introverts. Some of you get energy by just being around people, right? People get energized by being around people. Some people get deflated. <laughs> And they love to just be by themselves. They come in and then they want to be by themselves after a while. But we need all sorts of people in the church because God has designed you with that personality. He wants to change your character, but the diversity in the local church is something to be celebrated, not ignored, not tolerated. Okay? And it's important we do that. We can't just be around with the same people as us. Can you imagine what a boring church that would be like? Everybody talked and spoke like me. Everybody said the same things or dressed the same as me. No, God wants a unity in Christ, which is something on the inside, but there's a diversity of expression on the outside. And so we need to have grace for one another in that. Why? We naturally gravitate to the people that are just like us. And we're like, oh, that person's too loud. That person claps out of beat or that person, no. We need all of these guys in the church, right? Um... And so it's important that God uses all types of people who are in Christ for the extension of his kingdom. No one is excluded. He doesn't only use superstars. He uses everybody. In fact, he chooses to use those who are not because it reveals his glory more than anything else. And so you can be used and you must pursue diverse relationships in the Lord because God uses all. His relationships are also loving Have you seen how many times Paul uses the word beloved there? At least four times to describe some of the people. He even mentioned Rufus' mother, who was like a mother to him. These are people who Paul loves deeply, and he holds them dear to himself. These are not superficial relationships, friends. They are deep, sincere, loving relationships that are enabled by God's grace. Now, I don't believe that they were perfect relationships, But you do get the sense that they were sincere relationships. There's a family culture here to these relationships. And how beautiful are authentic Christ-centered relationships, hey? 
You know it and you can see it from a mile away when people love each other. Now I know that building these types of relationships leaves us all open to hurt and pain from people because they will, not may, they will sin against you. Okay? But I still want you to pursue these loving, authentic relationships. Remember, we have everything we need to succeed in pursuing these relationships. Okay? Why should we forgive when we've been sinned against? It's because Christ has forgiven us. If you are reminded of how much Christ has forgiven you, you will forgive others. You can repent. You can seek reconciliation in the Lord. You have everything you need. You have the Spirit of God in you to pursue these relationships. What we do often is once we get hurt once or something that happens, we don't want to pursue forgiveness and reconciliation. We prefer to separate. Okay? But God says, no, you've got to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And you and I have everything we need to build these relationships. We can move beyond the hurt. Forgiveness brings deeper, a deeper sense of your relationship. It moves to another level. When you, maybe myself and Stephen have been building a relationship and we've been chatting and there's something that he does that offends me or that he sins against me. Man, after we've resolved it, we have a deeper relationship now. I've heard something about where he was coming from. He's heard about me. We've taken it to the Lord. I'm not fighting against him. We put the problem in front of us and we forgive one another. Man, when you have those with people, you can walk much further with them. Why? You've walked the road together, right? And so we must invest in that. And then these were sacrificial, sacrificial relationships. Not selfless. Paul mentioned Priscilla and Aquila. They risked their necks for him. In other words, he was saying, they risked their lives for him. Can you imagine that? I mean, I was trying to put myself in that position. What would happen where I have to risk my life for another brother or sister? What would I do? These people were filled with the grace of God, the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the courage that was not supplied by other people, that they were willing to die for Paul. They probably visited him in prison where there was part, like it was really perilous times to preach the gospel in Rome. You could lose your life. But they went to visit him. These relationships were not for personal gain. People made big sacrifices. People moved cities and countries to plant churches new pe and to reach new people with the gospel. And these relationships were forged to serve others, not to be served. But they were still were so beneficial. Too often today, our relationships are marked with selfishness. Always, what can I get out of this? I'm meeting this person. Let's see what I can get out of this. Maybe it's something on the business. Or sometimes people want, want to be loved and don't want to love others. Even in ministry, if we're honest, we try to build relationships with people so that we can advance our own ministry sometimes. I'm sad to say that, but it's true. But these relationships were not about what you could get out. It's not to be served, but to serve others. I see this across a lot of relationships. It's marriages, friendships, businesses, all of these things. And people just want to get their fix out of the relationship from being around people, and then they want to discard them afterwards. And today also, there's a big danger, especially in the culture where I come from, and maybe it is here as well, you can tell me about it, where people want to just isolate themselves, especially after COVID. They want to, I call it selfish isolationism. They just want to be by themselves. I prefer rather to just check something online or do there, but I don't want to be around people. I want to be more as an individual. And God has hardwired us to be in community because God himself is in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were never designed, created by God to be by ourselves and to exist in isolation. We need to be in community with other people, serving the Lord together. And so it's not enough just to be at arm's length with people. We need to be together as we serve the Lord. And lastly, these relationships were generous. Okay? These people were generous with their time, with their gifts, with their money and possessions. And Phoebe is an example here. 
She is a deacon of the church and an influential woman. She is involved in advancing the gospel. She was going to Rome probably to deliver this letter to Paul, to the church. She's also described as a patron or a benefactor. That means somebody who could generously sponsor Paul and the others in advancing the gospel. She had a special gift and she had the means to do it. Now everybody is called to be generous. We're all called to be generous with our time, with our gifts and with our treasures that God has given us. But here we get to see someone who's been given a special gift to be generous to advance the gospel by supporting faithful men and churches. How generous are you in your relationship with others? Do you make time for them? Do you use your gift to serve others and to benefit them? Or do you keep it to yourself? Are you a gifted to be a patron or a benefactor in the advancement of the gospel? If that's you, respond in obedience to the Lord. That's how the Lord has gifted you. Don't keep it for yourself. 